I want to talk to you about my favorite segment, if you don't mind. Let's go for it. Corrections. Correction. Correction. Corrections yeah, is my I favorite know. segment. Can we talk about the origins? And I, you've done it for a while now. So, I mean, you're, this is catching on and people love it. It's a, it's such a, it's been such a fun journey. I mean, it was sort of born out of the vibe we had during the pandemic shows and liking the lo-fi feel of everything we were doing. With that said, we were thrilled to get the audience back and start doing a regular TV show again. But one of the things that we had a lot of fun with during the pandemic was just giving ourselves time to respond to what people were saying in the YouTube comments, because the YouTube comments was the only place we could go to find out what was working and what wasn't working. And one of the things I discovered by reading those is how nitpicky some of our viewers could be. I should stress lovingly nitpicky, but nitpicky nonetheless. The true origin, I think, was Legos. Saying I stepped on, a, you know, there were Legos all over the house. And uh, there's a very, I should say, robust Lego community who wants you to know it's uh, Lego bricks. That Lego is not a plural. <laughs> and so Lego is the name of the company. <laughs> and so that was one of the, the jumping off points there's a character in mad max named the um it i thought it was the doof warrior it's the duff warrior and a lot of okay. australians you know so they were and it's just funny because what we realized was in the act of trying to correct ourselves we would often i would often make a, a, a new additional mistake that would sort okay. of spiral it out so those were all within the body of the show and then i said to our producer mike shoemaker hey after everybody leaves on thursday i just want to read the camera i've written down everything i got wrong this week and we'll just put it on youtube and he said well what and i said no don't ask me any questions about it i will self-produce this entire piece and so i think the first one was maybe three and a half minutes and now they're all pretty consistently 20 minutes um <laughs> so they have uh but it's really fun it's it's this sort of um i don't know group think not group think that's i think <laughs> it's, it's like a group written and uh you know fan sourced and world building and it's been a really lovely way to feel connected to the audience i mean you've done quite a few by now i was trying to come up with a number and i'm guessing it has to be more than 30. are you kidding me that you don't know we have done uh 50. Oh, not only, not only have we done 50, but Dewey, we're speaking on Thursday. Tonight, after the show, I am recording The Spectacular, a celebration of 50. Oh, episodes. my. Yeah, I mean, to the fact that I made time for you today, I mean, obviously, everyone is running around with their heads cut off trying to get ready for The Spectacular. So will there be fireworks during The Spectacular? Will there be, uh, like, baton twirlers? It's going to have more production value than you've ever seen in an episode of Corrections. <laughs> I think that is, that's amazing, <laughs> amazing stuff. So we transition to my 1A favorite segment that I've always wanted to know the, the origin of. Not many late night hosts would have the, just the pure bravery to go day drinking. Yeah. And you are that man to go day drinking with some of the biggest celebrities in pop culture. I mean, where do we begin? How did this start? You know, it was funny. The first one I did was with my brother and we were just trying to figure out a way to do a remote segment. You know, obviously my family has been a big part of the show and I think we went day drinking in Brooklyn and the first few we did, it was always moving around to different bars and different locations and trying to come up with fun games to play and then we realized what was more unique about it was just sitting with a charismatic celebrity and not running all around the city as much as just sitting down in a comfortable bar and having a bunch of weird drinks and getting to see a different version and an authentic version of the people you're drinking with i think we all know that uh it's very hard to be guarded with your answers when you've had a, a few too many drinks and it's been a, and myself included i think that um you know a lot of people who have shows like these you by necessity you have to be control freak even during interviews you want to be thinking you know structuring sure. ahead and, and try to make sure you don't run out of 
things to ask about, but you can't really do that when you're also drinking. And so it's very liberating for me. I think the guests really like it. I mean, I have to pay a, a debt of gratitude to Rihanna. After that one, we get a lot of requests. And uh, I never thought we'd be in a situation where we were saying no to people uh, for day drinking. But the reality is I've only got the one liver <laughs> and, uh, and I'm getting a little older every year. So we're trying we're trying to be uh, liberal with how often we do it. I don't know if you're going to answer this, but is there a celebrity that would surprise me who has asked to do the day drinking segment? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to to slide on because you answered it, but you didn't. I walked into that. You one. knew, you knew that I yeah, gave you. Yes. Yeah. But I gave yeah. you, I gave you a piece of information. No, so that's, well, the not, a, not a useful piece, but a piece nonetheless. But the thing that makes your show stand out to me is it's so well written. It's so well structured. Your interviews are so poignant. A lot of different examples I could go to, but the one that stands out in my mind is the way you went about interviewing uh, Elliot Page. And you I mean, asked some pretty tough questions as well. Was that a very uh, time-consuming process to prepare or? Yeah, I'm, I think that often I would tell you best way to interview is you stay in the moment, obviously, but you want to be loose. You want to see where it goes. I did feel with Elliot, he was going to have something to say that both he wanted to say and people would want to hear. And it felt both important to me to get it right, to just to create that space for him to tell that story. Uh, and hopefully, I think this is something he wouldn't want as well. You know, you hope that eventually he can go back to just being a talk show guest, right? And talking about his projects and not having to go through that every time. And so, there was a bit of, it felt like it was a really important building block for what came next for him. And I was glad that we had the chance to do it together. I, I, could, you, I couldn't have said it better. I mean, that was, that was really phenomenal stuff. Who on your show doesn't get enough credit? <laughs> Who on my show? Well, I mean, Shoemaker. I mean, Mike Shoemaker is the greatest producer in TV history for my money. Certainly the best friend a writer's ever had. And I'm really lucky to, well, this show wouldn't be this show without, without Mike. And the fact that I've known him since I started at SNL and never have, I would never have done the show if he hadn't been available to do it with me. And then Alex Bays, who's the head writer of the show, greatest living joke writer in America, um, probably worldwide. I guess if you're the best joke writer in America, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb and say you might you might have the rest of the. It's like being the best basketball player in America. It feels like absolutely. Maybe, well, well, and you got Luka Doncic. So the point being, Bayes, uh, Shoemaker, and then you know there are obviously the people on this show we don't mention enough who are you know working behind the scenes. People like researchers who are, you know, such an integral part to how well the interviews go and our incredible segment producers who are very aware that by the time we get most guests a lot of them have been maybe at the eleven thirty shows promoting the same piece of work and so we have to find new ways to ask different questions and i always feel really safe and taken care of there and because of that i can focus on the writing which is i think the skill i can bring to this better than the others and when it comes time to do the sketch work or comes time to do the interviews, I, I just trust the people that have surrounded me. I mean, the mark of a successful talk show, obviously you have to have you or a version of you and the leading the charge, but you have to have a team. And I think more often than not, we gloss over who's behind the scenes and we focus on what we see. So I wanted to give you an opportunity to, uh, you know, give them their, 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 their credit where credit's due because the, the, your show won't be the, the show it is without your team. And it's, you know, a thing you learned at SNL is if you get the best people in any given field to run each department, it's so, it takes so much less energy to trust people than it does to oversee people. And so 
everybody who works here, I have this implicit trust in, which means I don't have to go knock on their door and say, I just want to make sure we're all in agreement on the hat, what the hat's going to look like. <laughs> it's, it's never that. And so then I can, you know, just sort of, uh, you know, bear down at my computer and, and write jokes all day, which is what I'd rather be doing anyway. Now, you're, you're hosting, you're writing, you're writing books, you're a well, you're well into your children's lives. I mean, that's been yeah. well documented. But the thing that is pressing on my head, this is where we're going to wrap. And I really appreciate your time because I know you got stuff to do. You know, like have, like, 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 like have a show or something. <laughs> um, do you feel that you are owed some sort of residuals from the unbearable weight of massive talent? Because you could make an argument that get in the cage, that segment from yeah. Weekend Update probably was what spurned that movie. So care to comment? Well, even if residuals were owed, I have to admit that they would not come to me. That was very much a Sandberg, Mulaney, Rob Klein uh, production. I was very lucky. I count myself incredibly lucky that I got to sit next to it. One of the greatest moments of my life was when the real Nick Cage came to the show and Andy and I had to go to his dressing room and read it with him. And it became abundantly and immediately clear to us that he had yet to read it. And yet there <laughs> he was in the room with us. And it's one thing when you hear Nick Cage wants to do it because then you think, great, he knows what the game is. He's going to be in it to win it. But then when he's in, when you're in the room with Nick Cage, who is every bit a movie star. And I say this as someone who's met a lot of celebrities. Some of them are actors, and maybe five of them are movie stars. <laughs> Nick Cage is a movie star. And we handed him the script and realized he maybe didn't even know what the premise of the sketch was. And he read it with Andy and I, and then he just looked up at us and said, all right, and uh, we always talk about it because Andy and I, we feel we uh, our memory of that day is we walked out of that dressing room and uh, and floated down the hallway with happiness. We like we went down the hallway the way like cartoon characters do when like a pie smells good and like carries them by their nose. Does, does he still? I, I know I said we're gonna wrap, but I just one more thing. Oh, please there. go I, dig in. Um, this is it. Does he still harass you uh, via the phone every so often about your uh, uh, about things going on in your life, your pets, uh, etc.? Yeah, so the the heartbreaking, you know, he has yet to come through. Um, but I lost a bet to him. I'm a Celtics fan. He's a Warriors fan, and this was my idea. So I'm paying the price for my own hubris. But I bet him that. If the Celtics won, I would write something about Frisbee, my dog, that he would have to say. And if the Warriors won, he would write something about my dog, Frisbee, that I would have to say. Um, Sandberg is, you know, a very lovable performer, but in real life, he's a bad person who hates my dog. And I'm very concerned about the words he might use uh, to make me speak of this beautiful beast that means so much to me.